Well, good evening, good of Christian Siena. Welcome, welcome to our appeal to heaven. Come on, we in the final stretch of appeal to heaven, and we're here to have a great time in the presence of God. Amen. Come on, right there where you are, stand to your feet. If those of you watching us online, you can stand to your feet as well. We're going to go ahead and praise the Lord in this place. Amen. Come on, here we go. Staring into your eyes makes my heart come alive. The sun deep of the light when I met you. Come on, we keep reaching. Reaching beyond the skies, running deep, stretching wide. Perfect love realized here with you. Yeah, this love. This love is for real, you will never let go, never let go. Oh, it's more than just words, love beyond my control, out of control. Here we go. This is real love, this is real love. This is real love, this is real love. Put your hands together. Clap. See, staring. Staring into your eyes makes my heart come alive. The suddenly brought to life when I met you. Here we go. One, two, three, praise. This is me love. This is me love. This is real love, this is real love This is his real love, amen. And his real love has come to us through his amazing grace. Come on, lift your hands up. I say, God, I've got amazing grace. Come on, let's praise God one more time in this place for his goodness and his grace and his mercy that follows us all the days of our lives, amen. Hey, come on, you can worship with us. We declare who breaks the power. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king of love all kings who shakes who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and he must bring in awe and wonder 
Here we go. Sing.
He has steadied us and tonight as we are standing in this place we have the lion of the tribe of Judah that is roaring over us and causing us to overcome in Jesus name I want you to shout Jesus Jesus come on when you say Jesus you just about agree with anything the Bible and everything the Bible says you can have in the promises that is laid up for you and I. Amen. Declare, say, I am God's child. I am God's child. He's in me. He's in me. I have Jesus. I have Jesus. Who is the, my co-heir. Who is my co-heir. And I am heirs with God. And I am heirs with Amen. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, give God a praise tonight. And I want to welcome all of you joining us tonight. We've got a, a, an amazing service planned for you tonight with a special guest. But before we do that, I want you to get ready to give to the Lord. And we're going to bring our seed to, to uh, as an offering before the Lord tonight. And all of you joining us in our different campuses, those of you in Strandfontaine, Belleville, Ocean View, Parklands, and also those in, at Healing Word, U.S. In the International in California, Orange County, wonderful to have you here with us. We're going to get ready to give to the Lord. And tonight as you come to give, our... Uh, 
our key thought for this week is the shield of faith. You know, I'm so, it was so interesting to read that in Ephesians 4 that the Bible says, pick up the shield of faith. Come on, we got to pick up that shield of faith. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I'm making a decision to activate my faith. Come on. You can stand and do nothing and watch the enemy come at you and just about feel like, oh, I'm, I'm defeated already. But when you pick up the shield of faith, there's a strength that comes to you. There's a strength that comes to your armor that you're able to block every fiery dart that the enemy fires at you. And tonight, as you come to give, we're joining our faith together. <laughs> there's a great saying that I wrote down. And um, I'm, I'm going to remember it, that the faith on any one of you at any given time is never greater than the faith on all of us together. So look at your neighbor and say, I'm joining my faith with you tonight. Yeah, I'm joining my faith with you tonight, believing that God's going to move supernaturally on our behalf. That God as the mighty man of war will go to speak will go to stand for you. Amen. He will give you the words of wisdom as you submit your life to Him in faith. I'm picking up that shield and I'm joining it with you as my fellow believers in the Lord. Amen. So tonight, let's prepare our seed and we're going to get ready to give to the Lord. Let's lift up our seed and pray tonight. Father, tonight we thank you, God, that as we activate our faith in our giving tonight, God, that you are a rewarder of those that diligently seek you and to God as as good of Christian center as a church that you've set on a heel Lord we've set aside 40 days Lord to come before you and appeal to heaven's court over our city over our government over our schools Lord and God we tonight declare that as we sow the seed God it stands before you as a memorial, just as in at Cornelius' house, Lord, his whole family was saved because you found him a devout man and he was set apart. He made a decision to set himself apart for you and his entire household was saved, Lord. And as we give tonight, this is a seed to declare our city will be saved, Lord. Our communities will be saved, God. We declare that no more violence will reign in our streets. Streets, God, in Jesus' name, no more substance abuse will reign in our city, God. But today we declare as your church, we are your church, God, and the gates of hell will not prevail in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, come out of your seats tonight. I want to invite you and let's give to the Lord tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and worship. Come on, declare you give life.
to Wednesday night war room and it's my privilege tonight to welcome David Nekrutman. Am I saying it right, David? Nekrutman. Nekrutman. <laughs> I'm doing a good job. Well, it's wonderful. Well, welcome to Good Hope Christian Centre and all the way to the southernmost tip of Africa, and I trust that we won't have any, only see you on the screen, but we'll be able to enjoy your ministry live and in person here in Africa. So I want to ask those of you that are with us in the, live and in person here in our congregations, you can be seated. And uh, so, David, you've served on the Christian-Jewish relations for 20 years now, and uh, I see the Jewish flag behind you there, and um, you've, you have a BA in Forensic Psychology from John Jay uh, College of Criminal Justice. I don't think I've ever seen a bio quite like this. <laughs> a Master's in Social Work from the University of Pennsylvania and an MA in Biblical Literature. So your forensics must have helped you dive deep into... The, the mysteries of the Word of God. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I don't want to treat the Bible like a crime scene. That you don't want to do. <laughs> well, I think there are many crime scenes, though. Yes. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> many crime scenes in the Word of God. And uh, so before we start tonight, I always like to open in prayer and just commit this time to the presence of the Lord. So won't you go ahead and just pray and invite the presence of God to do and say through you and through us whatever people need to hear in this time and in this season of Sukkot. Excellent. So first of all, we've come together today, Father in heaven, in fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 14, verse 6, where the nations of the world will be celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. 
I wish you would be with us physically in this land, but due to the coronavirus, we are unable to have you here physically. So therefore, we thank God for the technology to connect with one another and fellowship to en enhance our sweet tooth for your word, to take this sacred season, the amplified presence of God, and ask him, what is it that we wish to do for him? What does God want for us to do for him? We are in a sanctified time. We are in the pursuit of life, liberty, and holiness, more than happiness, because through holiness and through sanctification, we are happy doing your will. We ask God to give us the wisdom to understand your purposes in bringing the kingdom of heaven down to earth. Yes. So the yes. world will know yes. who God yes. is. Amen. And we say amen. Amen, amen, amen. So David, you have such an interesting bio and uh, an amazing interest in the Jewish Christian uh, relationship. You know, I, I think the Jewish people all over the world have suffered much persecution in these last days, and I believe that's why we're in, you know, the Bible talks about the last days that, you know, Jewish synagogues and are, they're having to have armed guards outside them to protect people as they go, and I don't think many people are really aware of the kind of persecution that the Jewish people are uh, going through even in this day and in this time. So perhaps you can just speak to that uh, for a moment and just kind of give us an insight into the, the situation. So bi biblically speaking, the, uh, the idea of anti-Semitism is not new. We know this from the book of Esther. Haman's hatred for Mordecai was such to a degree that he wanted to commit a Holocaust during the time of Esther. Yes. And it was, so it was an hatred without any reason, even though he might have an issue with Mordecai, didn't mean that I had to translate in, in one day that there would be a Holocaust. And uh, thank God that there were divine agents such as Mordecai and Esther, and specifically Esther in her role, yeah. ensuring that the people of Israel will return back to God. And what's kind of interesting is at the end of chapter eight, is that there is this epiphany within the Gentile world to understand the remarkable, uh, and I say this with a capital R, the remarkable God of Isaac says yes. this at the end of chapter eight, where all of a sudden they're willing to put their destiny with the Jewish people. So there's a remnant within this kingdom that was had a decree to kill all the Jews and they side with the Jews and there is a war and the Jews won with a remnant wow. within the Gentile uh, uh, kingdom. So for me, anti-Semitism is there. It's not anti-Semitism against the Jews. It's, anti it's really hatred towards God's will. That's how I look at anti-Semitism. Wow. And for people to go ahead and have this conviction of anti-Semitism it comes with that, with sort of the irrationality of just of a human being, and it's uh, it's these evil force that happens and takes over a person. If you truly believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then his decision to choose a particular people to be a light unto nations, but doesn't mean that it's a it for us is that we're different and we're higher than anyone else. Our responsibility for kingdom means that we have to be a good steward in this particular geographic location and then have partnerships with the nations of the world. Unfortunately, uh, throughout the history, specifically with the church in the last 2,000 years in the name of Jesus, have done horrible things to the Jewish people. But what I have seen, and this is sort of the Esther moment, uh, yes. of Christians willing to step out of the theological anti-Semitism that was within the church and saying that I have this download to stand with the Jewish people and it's people like you and others and millions around the world that are willing to do this. And for me, that's the, the miracle of our lifetime that in a sovereign Jewish state of Israel, that we have a remnant within Christendom willing to stand in covenant with each other and 
for 20 years, I've been serving this sacred calling to bridge Jews and Christians together so they get to know each Beautiful. other. Because for 2,000 years, we Beautiful. haven't had that, wow. that conversation. We just, we come with wow. prejudices. Yeah. Listen, I wasn't a lover of Christians when I first started out. Uh, I grew up within the very uh, insular uh, world of the Orthodox Jewish community in New York. And I was taught uh, never to go into a church. And uh, some of my friends would actually cross the street when they would approach a church because of what, what I, again, what you see in the salvation in the cross for us that was used as forced conversions, pogroms, Spanish Inquisition. We as Jews live in the collective memory of our people and it's literally at the present on our shoulders right now. So we live collectively in memory. And because of that memory, it's very hard to move into a position of trust and fellowship with Christians who are very sincere about this relationship. So when I first entered into the sacred calling 20 years ago, when I worked for the Israeli consulate in New York, uh, again, I all thought you were medieval Catholics because that's what I was taught when I was a young child. I didn't know there were 40,000 40, different movements within Christendom. So I, I just rushed up on Sister Act 2, and I thought that would be enough for me to enter into a church. But apparently, I entered into a charismatic, you know, Pentecostal charismatic, you know, uh, tongue service, and this was not in the movie. So this was a very uh, Twilight Zone uh, moment for me wow. when going in and seeing Christians who were very sincere in the relationship with Israel. And ever since then, uh, I've been a bridge builder. And my last, uh, I actually, early this month, I served for 14 years for Ortar Stone Center for Jewish Christian Understanding Cooperation. And now I'm moving into a new chapter in Jewish Christian relations. And uh, you, you got me at my new beginning of my new chapter uh, of Jewish Christian relations. So you're the, this new beginning that well, this is particularly significant during this season because with the Jewish New Year, it's a season of new beginnings. It's uh, a exactly. season of fresh starts. And so I don't think that we as Christian charismatics always understand the significance of the Jewish feasts and festivals. And, uh, you know, for the past uh, number of years, every, every year, I think it's five years now, Pastor Grant. Yes, five years we've been meeting like this together. <laughs> Sorry. I was okay. I, I'm hearing Pastor Grant. <laughs> yes. You mean five years. Five, five years, years we've been meeting together like this for 40 days, um, round about the... Uh, the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah. And, and it's been a wonderful season for us as a church to get together and pray like this. So this, we this say is, we... again, this is a testament. This is a miracle because wow. I want to correct. I want to be able to sort of adjust the paradigm. This is not a Jewish VIP uh, season. This is a universal season. Yes. Uh, Okay, Leviticus chapter 23, although there are Jewish practices to what we are doing, what we're doing on these holidays, does not take away from what the rest of the world that believes in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is supposed to think theologically into these feasts. Uh, it was, listen, I'll, I'll, let, me, let me give you sort of two key words, two Hebrew words yes. that will help. Yeah. Okay, Thank two you. Hebrew words to put into the vocabulary right now. Okay. The first one is going to be or, which is light, which is mentioned in Genesis, at the beginning of Genesis. You know this on the first day. God said, let there be light, and there was light, right? And we think light, often when you do a cursory reading of the Bible, we think of light like the sun or the Tama Edison invention of the light bulb. But that's not true because the sun didn't come in until the fourth day. So I would like to translate the word light, which is in Hebrew, or, this is your or. Hebrew word for today, o -R. or, or, O-R, yes. capital O, capital R, so you wouldn't get or. mixed up with O-R, <laughs> either or. Uh, so or would be linear time. Yes. That's the, how, okay, so God uses familiar words in unfamiliar ways in the first chapter of Genesis. That's good. Beautiful. So yes. we know that there is or, we're used to that word, but Life. or has a different connotation from a God perspective, yes. from God creating the idea of him and the ideas to have a relationship with him. So God knows at the end, he's going to create humanity. He knows he's going to create humanity with free will. 
That free will comes with the acceptance of God, but also with the choice of denying God. Yes. Mm. So God's original merciful act as he's creating the world and knows that the end game is about the relationship, which he wants humanity to freely choose him, not to be forced as robots, but to have this relationship. The Bible is about relationship. That's where Jews and Christians agree on. It's yeah. totally about relationship. Yes. But you have to create the idea of who God is right. and the ability to have that relationship. That's good. So if God creates the idea of time, Time is divine. So uh -huh. he has to create something called linear time. That's a that. past. Time is present. divine. <laughs> time is divine. They can hashtag it's not that. <laughs> okay, time is divine. It's not something on your watch. It's something that God created. It's yes. not a human yes. invention. Yes. This is extremely important. The construct of a past, present, and future is also a divine construct, a divine idea. Uh. God knew that people will say no to him. But there, if there was ever a moment where people will say yes to him, the past cannot overwhelm a future with God. That's why it's called the past. Wow. But you can have a future with God at the present moment when you say yes to him. That's why this, again, this is a very Hebraic concept. That's why in the church, you have this concept called born again. Yeah. If you truly understand the theology of born again, that means your old self has nothing to do with yes. your new self. Beautiful. Well, how does that work? Wow. Well, you have to have a past, present, and future. Yes. Where did that concept come from? On the first day of creation, when God created R. That's linear time. On the fourth day, if you look at what was created, the sun, the moon, the luminaries, the function is not just the sunshine. The function is the season, the years, yes. the concept of cyclical time. Yes. yes. That's good. Okay. Wow. Okay, so on the first day we have linear time, that's or. or yes. On the fourth day we have mit or rot. That's your second Hebrew word, mit, mit or rot, which you already hear in mit or rot the concept of or. Mm. So I'll do it again, mit or rot, and mit you look in the Hebrew, root. you will have mit or rot, M E O R O T, -E and mit or rot, mit or rot. is translated yes. as cyclical time. Okay. Yes. And what Leviticus chapter 23 is speaking to is cyclical time. Yes. yes. All right. That, first of all, one of your major cyclical times is going to be the Sabbath. That happens every, every week. Yes. The idea of seven days is actually a divine construct. Most civilizations back in Abraham's time had 10 or 13 days. Yes. Never seven. Even in our lifetime, under Stalin, he wanted to eradicate religion and wanted six days in a week. When f after the French Revolution, they wanted a 13-day week. Wow. The idea that we have seven days in a week is truly divine. Divine. All wow. right? But every single week is a, is a moment of cyclical time because that's the Shabbat. Because what's happening on Shabbat, what's happening on the Sabbath is God's amplified presence is more felt than any other day in the week because every single day had chaos to order, whereas the Sabbath, it was, there was no chaos to order. It was complete. Yes. What God created was Sabbath, was what we call in Hebrew Shabbat. Yes. So let's just recap. We have on the first day linear time, which is or. or. The fourth day is cyclical time, which is mi'orot. Shabbat is your, one of your first cyclical times, but that happens every week, and we're, yes. uh, we're enhancing our understanding what God wants us for, for, him, for us to do for him in the coming week and to reflect what we've done with him in the week past. But every year, there are different now cyclical times being introduced into the world that we need to reflect in certain concepts. And in Leviticus chapter 23, what's happening is the unfolding of cyclical time seasons with different themes. The first thing coming up is what you call Rosh Hashanah, Yes. And Rosh Hashanah is about the acceptance, our renewal of the acceptance of God's kingdom. It is the birthday of humanity. Wow. So we believe in Jewish tradition, Adam and e Adam, the first human being, was created on Rosh Hashanah. So when you, ha when you know it's your birthday, it's a time to reflect. But who are we reflecting about? We're reflecting about our relationship with the king. 
Because the one who rules this world is not me. It's not you. It's yes. God. And if I accepted God in my life and I accepted his kingdom, then I have to reflect about that kingship. So Rosh Hashanah is about kingship. Now, once you have accepted that you renewed this commitment, not, not only individually, but universally. Again, this is not Jewish VIP feats. This yes. is humanity. Yes. At one point in time, uh, all, there was a moment where people who did believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob took this time out to reflect on that concept. Once you do that, then you have to see, okay, if I, did it, if I really truly believe in God's kingship and I truly believe that I'm supposed to be his divine agent to carry it out, his will, are we doing a good job or not? That's the Day of Atonement. And the days in between from Rosh Hashanah to the Day of Atonement. Are we doing what's right for God? If not, what do we need to do to improve? What's causing us not to do the correct thing? Now, again, this is, I know most people think it's about sins and atoning for sins. But again, when we're looking at sins in a covenantal relationship with God, you have to look at it from the prism of, am I sanctifying God every moment of the day? Or am I treating time like an accessory to murder. I hate the expression killing time. Wow. <laughs> because that means that means you are now involved in literal murder of something that's divine. Wow. That's good. Wow. I've never seen you're, that. You're, never seen that. Our before. job, our yes. job every day, every moment is an opportunity because we only have a certain amount of time on earth. What are we going to do for God? So although uh, we, I, we both believe we're saved and we're going to uh, enjoy grape juice in heaven with one another. Uh, <laughs> therefore, at the end, the question is, is what we're doing for God right now on earth. Right. How are we bringing that kingdom down? And if we're not doing a proper job, then universally, we have to know what we need to do. Okay. Yes. Once you're in that season right now of kingship and the reflection of where we are in our actions in unfolding the kingdom of God, then we are now in the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. Yeah. So, right. Pastor, without knowing what you know, I would just like to hear from you for one moment, what do you think Sukkot, which is the Hebrew word for the Feast of Tabernacles, what are we celebrating from your perspective? I would love to hear from you for a moment before I go into the message of Feast of Tabernacles. Well, Sukkot, as I understand it, we were in Israel one time uh, during Sukkot, and uh, it was quite a miraculous season. In fact, during that season, one Israeli um, soldier had been taken prisoner by the Palestinians, and the Israeli government and the Israeli Jewish people, or the Jewish people, I should rather say, they valued the life of the soldier so much that they released a thousand Palestinian prisoners for the life of one man during this season. And so we walked the streets, and of course you see the little outdoor um, booths that are, that are built. And to me, it speaks of a season that God needs us to be in a place of flexibility, to be able to move with him, that yes. we don't, uh, we're not uh, stuck on this, in this world and in this earth, that our, our mind needs to be on heavenly things, and that the moving of God in our lives is always moving forward, and so the, the season of Sukkot, the tabernacles or booths, people put outside because it's a reminder to them that they need to be in a constant state of openness and awareness to where God wants to take them in moving with him. Now, I could be entirely wrong, and I'm okay. open to correction. <laughs> Pastor, we're going to expand that concept, okay? okay? We're going to expand what you're talking about because you're hitting on the heart uh, of what the Feast of Tabernacles is about. Just by you simply visiting and seeing what was happening, you're seeing us living outside of our homes in these temporary huts. Yes. Right? That's the physical manifestation of what we do as Jews, as a Jewish practice, is based upon 
Leviticus chapter 23, and you'll, and you'll have the verses from uh, verse uh, 38 all the way to the end of the chapter, which is 44. Those are your essential verses that talk about the Feast of Tabernacles that involve certain practices, biblically speaking, that we need to take into consideration. Yes. Now, specifically, what you saw when you visited the land is Leviticus chapter 23, verses 42 through 43. Now, I'm going to translate it a little differently than what most of your translations you have. So I'm, I'm encouraging everyone to open up their Bibles and just listen for a moment of how I'm going to translate this. Yes. So verse 42 is live in Sukkot for seven days. Okay? I think most translations will say booths. Yes. Or tabernacle, right? So I'm going to booths. leave it in dwelling booths. I'm going to leave it yes. in the Hebrew called Sukkot. Yes. Okay. Every citizen in Israel must live in Sukkot. Okay. So again, you just told me to live in Sukkot for seven days. So obviously you're talking to everybody. Now God is, is sort of redundant. Every citizen in Israel must live in Sukkot. Right? So you know when we, we, we're all uh, people who are really understanding the Bible, when you have redundancies, and from a God perspective in his word, it's not there simply to repeat. It's there for a rhyme and a reason. This is what we call exegesis, interpretation of the scripture, hermeneutics in the academic world. Uh -huh. You simply, if I, was, if I was the editor of the Bible, my version will be very simple live in Sukkot for seven days. Yes. I don't need the rest of the verse, correct? So I mentioned already in this verse, Sukkot twice. And we know that we're supposed to be living in the Sukkot. It doesn't tell me what it is. It just tells me I'm supposed to be living in it. Yes. Then it says, what's the reason? So the future generations will know that I made the children of Israel dwell in Sukkot. Yes. When I took him out of the land of Egypt, I am the eternal, your God. I know most Bibles will say, I am the Lord, your God. But in this case, this is the four-letter Hebrew name of God. Uh, you say Yehovah or Yahweh. Yes. Uh, Jews do not pronounce that name. I'm only doing it for educational purposes. Thank you. But that four-letter name of God is a fusion of past, present, and future. God above time. Wow. All right. Wow. So what, so it's very important what's happening here. So the future generations will know that I made the children of Israel dwell in Sukkot. When I took them out of the land of Egypt, I am the eternal your God. So God who's above time will know for sure whether or not we're going to be keeping this. And we've seen it through each generation. But again, for the third time in two verses, I have the repetition of Sukkot. Does it tell me how to build the Sukkot? What does it look like? No. Okay. Now, there, what did Jews live in in the desert time? You know this because you know the, the Gentile prophet who wanted to eradicate the Jewish people in the book of Numbers, and his name was Bilam. Right? He was hired by the king of Moab to put a curse on the Jewish people, and his curses he tried to do ended up severely blessing the people. And in Numbers chapter 24, verse 5, Bilam says, How goodly are your tents. Yes. Oh, Jacob, your dwelling places. Now, I'm going to give you two Hebrew words in that verse. How goodly are your tents, which is ohel, ohalim. Ohel for being singular, ohalim being plural, many tents. So ohel is the Hebrew word. The second Hebrew word is Mishkan, which is a dwelling place. So if I tell you right now what word should be in there but's missing, you should say to me, which word? Sukkot. But does, does Bilam say, how goodly are your Sukkot? No. No. He mentions a different type of word. So let's give you some Hebrew words to put in the vocabulary. Number one, we have Sukkot. We don't know what that means yet. We have something called Ohel, which is a, a uh, tent. And we have something called the Mishkan, which is a dwelling place. But a Mishkan is not, a, a, a dwelling place is not an Ohel, it's not a tent. 
a whole L, a tenth is not a Sukkot. Oh, wow. Okay, so this is the importance of knowing Hebrew because once you know the Hebrew, then you, we can appreciate what this holiday is really representing. It's not that I'm supposed to live in a tent. If I put a tent outside my, my, my porch or downstairs where I live right now, I am not fulfilling Sukkot. I'm living in a tent, but I'm not fulfilling a Sukkot. Okay. Uh, all right, so it's important to know what this word Sukkot is all about. So for that, you need to know where the first time the Hebrew word Sukkot appears in the Bible. That comes into Genesis chapter 33, verse 17. Right? So Jacob travels to Sukkata. He builds a house for himself. And for his flock, he makes a sukkah. Oh, yeah. This is why it's called Sukkot. So again, Genesis chapter 33 is the first time you're going to, the word Sukkot appears. All right. And it's a very weird thing. Again, this is happening wow. after Jacob encounters Esau. We all, you know, this dramatic moment where brother is meaning brother. Uh, Esau really wants to kill, up, kill Jacob. They end up kissing part ways. Jacob then, then travels to this place called Sukkata. He builds a house for himself, yeah. but for his cattle, he makes a sukkah. sukkah. And that's why it's called Sukkot. Yeah. Okay? This yeah. should shock everybody. Wait, wait a second. So literally, the place is called after the barn of the flock. Wow. <laughs> yes. I've never seen yes. that. Right? Right. Wow. All right, so th this is extremely important because literally this is a, first of all, it's a temporary dwelling. Yes. Because he's going to be, he's going to be going somewhere else, yes. right, after this. He's not staying here. But what's interesting, he's, he, as he's building something permanent, which is a house, Yes. he also built something that's temporary, temporary. that's for his flock. Yes. So if wow. I take this concept that it's it's a, it's no matter what it's a temporary place, but I'm I'm building something that's really for a flock for for the animals. Now let's go back to in Sukkot you shall dwell. That means yeah. I'm living in this barn type of contraption. Yes. Right. That's weird. Like I am now on the level of what Jacob did in Genesis chapter thirty-three, verse seventeen. So if I could give you the first message of Sukkot is all I need with God is a few pieces of wood and a relationship with him. Wow. 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 Yes. All right? Yes. It's not, understand what we're doing. We're going outside of our homes, right? We're literally doing a little bit opposite of what Jacob did. Jacob built a house for himself. What yeah. am yeah. I doing? I'm going out of that house and going into the barn. Because I don't need all of the, what I do in, in my life, and I built up all this material and wealth. Now, however big my house is, it doesn't really matter. Because in the relationship with God, God. if you are permanent in the place that you are, yes. and you don't feel you're temporary, then Isaiah prophesizes this all the time. You guys became fat, and you lost that passion for God and you got so caught up in the materialism that you literally now just do lip service but your heart is nowhere near God the only way we can appreciate that we're not we're not the owners of this world and that we're not the gods of this world is that once a year we go into this temporary shack and we say that's all we need with you all we need is you, God, and, and a, few, a, few, uh, a few planks of wood. Now, yeah. you should just know that the minimum requirement for a sukkah is two walls and a little bit of a third wall. And the way I could demonstrate to you is with my arm. Here's the first part of the arm. Here's the second part of the arm. And this is my hand, which we represent the third part of the wall. But it's not a full, full enclosure. Yes. What this represents is a hug. Ah. The, sukkah, wow. the sukkah is God's hug of us. Whoa. Wow. 
That's that is the beautiful. second method. Wow, wow, that's beautiful. What a beautiful picture that is. What a beautiful okay. picture. It is the only mandate of space yes. that we're completely enveloped in the divine presence of the God. And the minimum requirement is beautiful. The minimum requirement is a hug. So what are, what's really happening is that I'm saying to God, yes, well, I can, I've accepted your kingship. I, I have reflected on what I've done wrong and what I need to improve. And in this amazing season, God says, you know what? Good, you took out the time for that. Now I'm going to give you the hug that you desire the relationship that you want. Yeah. But wow. every single thing that we do must come with the action to say, I accept. There's n you have to understand, in this season, it's not what we have in this season. I call it the prophetic season. Yes. There are two types of things that happen in atonement and sin. There is the office of the priest, and there's the office of the prophet. Yes. In the office of the priest, the best way I could describe it is if you ever ran uh, a red light uh, or you went above the speeding limit. Uh, but let's say, unfortunately, you went through the red light and you went, you went above the speed limit and you crashed into somebody, but thank God nothing happened to the other person besides damage to the other person's car. What will happen to you on your license is you will have points. And a few years from now, you can go ahead and take a driver's course and wipe that record clean, yeah. Yeah. right? That's, in every single country, you have the ability to do that. That's the office of the priest when it comes. You did something specifically wrong, then we have the right driver's course for you to, to wipe the slate clean. However, in the office of the prophet, which is all about relationships, when it comes to sin and atonement, the damage done from party A to party B still needs to be rectified. You still need to ask for forgiveness. Oh. Yes. Right? That even, even in, in the gospels, Jesus says, you need before you come to the altar, you need to make amends to your friend. Right? That's a very Hebraic concept. Before you can ask forgiveness from God, you must ask for forgiveness from your fellow human being. Oh. None of what we're doing in the concept of the kingdom of God and the reflection of whether we're doing the will of God is outside the context of the universal community. It's always first and prim uh, uh, primary, our relationship with our fellow human being. For the two main categories and the foundations for the word of God is based upon love of God and love of neighbor. Mm. That's it. And this season, when we're reflecting on the kingship and where is our relationship and are we doing the right thing? Then we're in the time when God's divine presence is around and we're doing this in the sukkah and then we invite people in and we fellowship with our fellow human being in the sukkah. What? So that's the third message. You can't do sukkah without anyone. So I, this is the why it's so important when Zechariah chapter 14 verse 6 is, is very important. Like why are the Gentiles coming into what would be a Jewish, what we would perceive to be a Jewish VIP holiday? Because none of these holidays our Jewish VIP holidays. They're universal holidays. It's just now at the particular time that Zechariah is envisioning this, he's hoping that the Gentile world will wake up to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and put their destiny with the nation of Israel. Remember, when Moses is you know, taking the Jewish people 40 years in the desert, no one really was believing in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then when he declares in his farewell speeches in the book of Deuteronomy, hear Israel, Shema Yisrael, our, the eternal, our God, the eternal is one. That is a prophetic statement because the only people believing in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were the children of Israel and a, what we would call a mixed multitude that went out with the Jewish people from Egypt. That included the, the high royalty people in the, house, in the house of the king all the way to other slaves. There were other people who saw the power of God in Egypt and said, I'm, I'm putting my destiny with the Jewish people. And I think Every a, single a, a lot of people actually miss that concept, David, that there were a mixed multitude that left Egypt with the Jews. And yeah. 
I, I haven't. I, that's why I, for me, this is for 20 years, I have seen personally this prophecy being fulfilled. Like, mo again, because of Jewish history, we tend to be more insular and not trusting. But covenant in its truest form, a social covenant, yeah. is trust based upon love. But the only way that happens is through action. If I just constantly say I love my wife and I don't bring her the flowers or the chocolate or show her actions of affection of love, then this relationship is not going anywhere. Right. All the words is great. You need to also show action. I think there's a book called James within in, in, in the, in the uh, Christian scriptures that talks about that, that uh, you need the action to affirm the faith. Well, it's no different than a social covenant between humanity bringing God into the world that there's always going to be the nation of Israel with everyone else who partnered with us in a social covenant based upon trust, trust on the foundation of love. And you see this constantly throughout. As I began with, the, with Esther, right? The Jews were not the only ones in the military fighting against people. It was this remnant that in the kingdom, a non-Jewish kingdom that sided with the Jews. And Isaiah, at the end of Isaiah, Isaiah says that the entire world will be celebrating new moon from new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath. Well, how is that going to work if we don't bring the concept, these Hebraic concepts of the, the festivals, cyclical time, and the Sabbath, the, the, like the ultimate of all holidays? I love what you said when we began to, to share how the time is divine, that uh, the timing of God is always perfect. And so when we look back at the Jewish festivals, we see that Jesus was crucified at Passover. And that was a fulfillment of the word of God. And then, of course, there's the uh, Pen Pentecost where they received the Holy Spirit, or there was speaking of the Holy Spirit being poured out. And of course, this season, and uh, the, the Rosh Hashanah, it, it also means the opening of the books, doesn't it, David? In Jewish, yeah, in Jewish yes. tradition, we have this concept that, that it is a judgment day. Yes. Uh, but judgment day, again, judgment day saying that the books, why are the books being open? What does that, what does that real concept mean? You shouldn't come into a relationship with the fear of God doing heavenly consequences on you. That's not a healthy relationship. It's based upon fear. Yeah. What we want is to develop a relationship of, of we are so, we're so in passion with God to do his will that God says, okay, if you're there with me, then the book is sealed for life, for health, and whatever you need. All I need from you, really, at the end of the day, is what Moses said in, De in Deuteronomy chapter 30, is for you to turn. It's, the word is called tishuva, which usually translates to repentance, but it doesn't mean repentance. It means to turn. All you need to do is turn. And, and, and in Deuteronomy chapter 30, Moses is saying it's not, it's not in the heavens and it's not in the sea. It's very close to you. It's returning to your heart and what comes out that matches your heart. It's close to you. This is the season of turning to God because yes. the theme, the cyclical theme that's happening is kingship, reflection, and, and the divine presence embracing us. Beautiful. So, David, you were born and raised as an Orthodox Jew. Still an Orthodox Jew. And, <laughs> but, but so that... For the, from the Christian perspective, and how, yeah. how did you in, encounter Jesus and, and, and Christianity and kind of this mission come to you to join the two together so that, you know, because it's a fulfillment of, of the prophetic word that in the last days that, that the Christians and and the Jewish people would be joined together because we we grafted into the the same same vine as it were. But the, the Jews are the original one, but the, the Christians are being grafted in as it were. So from again, I, I'm an Orthodox Jew. I've been involved in the sacred calling of Jewish Christian relations for over 20 years. 
Uh, I can't be who I am as a Jew in the context of the nation of Israel without you. Everything that happens has to be a covenantal partnership together of bringing God into the world. Uh, so therefore, what I see in Christianity specifically that believes in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that has taken on the act of calling to stand with Israel, there are two responses I can have with that. I could say, that's nice. You do what you need to do, and I'll be over here because I don't want to have anything to do with you because of the past. Or what I feel is what God wants is for us to actually work together despite some of the theological conundrums that sort of separate Orthodox Judaism from, from Christianity. At the end of the day, I'm a finite human being serving the infinite God. I don't have all the answers. Right. All I can do is try to follow God the best I can, but that doesn't mean I, only, I do this in my own bubble with my own people. So I noticed this. The wake-up call was 20 years ago going to the local Spanish-speaking church service in Brooklyn, New York, when I was working for the Israeli consul in New York, and that changed the trajectory of my life's calling. I originally wanted to be a Jewish Al Pacino. I just wanted, you know, I ended up, I ended up in politics, and then I ended up in the Israeli consulate, and you know, explain, God gave me at a very explain the Jewish Al Pacino to me. I, Jewish Al Pacino for me, Al Pacino is one of the greatest actors ever. I so I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to be Al Pacino. So, okay, uh, that was my 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 teenage, yes. my I should say even my childhood dream. <laughs> but God had something else for me. Uh, my, so, my thoughts uh, immediately went to line. my my thoughts immediately went to Al Pacino being part of the mafia. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> so no. that's why we're asking for you to <laughs> just explain. No, no, I know, I know. <laughs> but uh, so so what led me like uh, for 20 years been doing this, but in middle uh, towards from 2013 to 2018. Uh, my own mentor in Jewish Christian relations in, in 20, 2013 passed away. And people said to me, you know, you need to take him over. And I'm like, well, my rabbi, Rabbi Dr. Joel Meister, blessed memory. I mean, that's, he spoke eight languages. He, his main role really was in Jewish Catholic and Jewish mainline Protestant relations. My real, my real calling is within the spirit-filled Christian world and Orthodox Judaism. And that's where I feel really most comfortable uh, with and walking out that, that calling. But uh, my last conversation with my rabbi was, I think there is some, there's never been anything on the Holy Spirit that's been talked about between Jews and Christians at any conferences. Yes. And I believe that there's something about uh, what we say, we, we say in Hebrew, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, which is in English. Um, there's something about that, that there's a lot of language that is in common between Jews and Christians, but we never talked about it. And my rabbi, this happened really right, right before Passover. He was here in Israel, and he says, okay, we'll speak after the holiday. And I didn't know that he had cancer, and he passed away before Passover. So at that particular point in time, uh, when he passed away, I said, okay, I think my calling will be moving into the direction, academically speaking, and, 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 and understanding the language of the Holy Spirit from a Christian perspective so I can create the language of relationship between Jews and Christians. So I spent my time getting a master's in biblical literature at Oral Roberts University, making me the only Orthodox Jew ever to graduate from a spirit-filled university. Uh, wow. But I did write about the Holy Spirit. I wrote about specifically Esther and the Holy Spirit. Yes. Hey. Wow. And when you wrote about Esther and the Holy Spirit, because this season, as you were talking about Sukkot, and God embracing us, it's really, we can't see God with our eyes or touch him with our hands, but it's the Holy Spirit that we sense embracing us, that his presence comes to us by the Holy Spirit. So when you, you wrote about Esther and the, the Holy Spirit, what was the, the thing that, the, or the, the revelation that God would have God gave to you? Uh, so I'll give you, for me, it was, first of all, for Jews to return back to Israel at the time they did, and when you're a witness to it because you came to Israel from the four corners of the world, yes. that's a Holy Spirit move. 
Wow. We speak about the Holy Spirit. We might not use the same terminology. Yes. The difference between Jews and Christians will be whether or not the Holy Spirit is a persona or not. Mm. Uh, in Christianity, you believe Father, Son, Holy, uh, Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal. Therefore, it's a persona within a Trinitarian understanding of God. Whereas within Jewish theology, it is an it. It is the way God communicates with his people, with the individual, because we all possess a soul. And you actually were singing it, that God gave us his breath, right? Yes. God exhales his breath into us, right? right? That's why you're praising, right? Mm. That, ex that exhale created our soul. Yeah. The Ruach, so when we, Kodesh. Yeah, everything, everything that happens with the soul is a motion of wind. Wow. Something wow. that moves. Wow. Yeah. So when we're talking, so there's a lot that we, we, we share in common uh, as far as how the Holy Spirit moves within the people. How can you explain millions of people from the four corners of the world, Jews, that have been dispersed for the four corners of the world returning? Well, that's a biblical prophecy, but how did it happen? Well, that's a, a move of the Holy Spirit. So every day I wake up in a, in a country that's a testament to the Holy Spirit. Yes. So then the second greatest miracle is I am speaking to you, which should not happen, but it is. So that's, that's also a move of the Holy Spirit. Your willingness to even talk about uh, Sukkot and inviting me into your, to your church, is, to me, you might not think is, is a big thing. It's huge because there are not many Christians doing this. Sure. Statistically speaking, statistically, I went through the numbers. Maybe 20 million Christians around the world have an act of calling for Israel and the Jewish people. Not something that you just sort of check off in a poll. Do you, do you think Israel should exist? No, no, no. That you're doing something for Israel, that you're, you're attaching yourself to the Jewish people. That, that, that statistic is less than 1% of Christendom out of over 2 billion people that identify with Christianity. Wow. So for me, that you're willing to do that and walk with me, that's a move of the Holy Spirit. I can't explain it any other way. So when I look yes. at Esther, which way pointed out with the, the, the relationship between the Gentiles and the Jewish people, but you also see four categories of the Holy Spirit. Number one, the what I call the FBI uh, unredacted uh, files. Uh, if you ever know anything that happens in, in, in uh, police and FBI, you, there's files that you have a blackout yes. with a marker, a yeah. black marker that you can't see all that classified information. Well, in the concept of the Holy Spirit, there's something called the unredacted files. That means you have information that you shouldn't have <laughs> because it's happening through the, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So I'll give, I'll give you an example. Like Haman, that's Haman awesome. is coming in chapter six yes, yes. while the king is suffering from insomnia. And the verse says, and Haman said in his heart, like, wait a second. Uh -huh. How do we know what he said in his heart? Yeah. Unless it was revealed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit right? Mm -hmm. So that's the unredacted, you know, security file. We, we can have it all clean. We have access to information we shouldn't have. Right. I'll give you another example. Um, the very idea that in uh, Esther chapter 9, verse 27, that Esther says that Purim, this holiday she puts on the books, um, will, will be forever. Well, how is that possible? Well, that's, the, that's prophecy of the Holy Spirit. Yes. She receives something that says internally this holiday, I still celebrate Purim. Because Esther, through the Holy Spirit, Put this That's holiday on the uh, on the biblical on the biblical calendar. Now it's not on the same level as a Passover or the Feast of Tabernacles. Yes. Still, the ability to put something on the books like this is huge. It was the holiday of Purim, and everything that happened was was a move by the Holy Spirit. It was uh, it was put on the books by the Holy Spirit. It's a totally Holy Spirit holiday. That's what what Purim is about. Her meaning the what people know is the feast of uh, the feast of uh, Esther. And so, I hope that gives you some insight. Yes, yes. Well, Esther also she stepped out, and her uncle Mordecai said to her, "Who knows?" In Esther chapter four, who knows that you've come to the kingdom for such a time, a time as this? Yeah. 
that the purposes of God in, in your life and in our lives here, all the way in Africa, you're in, are you, where are you? Are you in, are you in Jerusalem? I'm right in now? Israel. I'm in Israel right now. I'm in, I'm actually in a city called Netanya. Oh, yes. So if you, you've been to Israel, so I'm like 20 minutes away from Caesarea. Okay. So that will help you. I'm on the coastal side. Okay. Okay. It's beautiful. See, this is my international headquarters, four by four, right over here <laughs> on my porch. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're reaching the world from your porch. Who would have known all, all the way into the southernmost tip of Africa? And I was going to go ahead and do it from the sukkah, but it, people are eating a meal right now, and there was going to be noise in the background, so I came upstairs to my house. So, but who knows? What, I'll go back to that scripture where... Um, Mordecai said to Esther, who knows that you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And I believe that in this time of prayer that we've set aside, that the kingdom of God, you talked about the king and the kingdom, that the kingdom of God will be established in our hearts and in our lives in this season. And so I want to thank you, David. It's been remarkable tonight, the insight that you've given us into the word of God and that, you know, the fact that time is divine and, and you know, when you said you hate the phrase killing time because it's killing the divine of God. Yes. God gave us time. He created it. And I'd never seen that before. And I know for many people who are sitting with us in our churches that we need to value the time that God gives us that like Esther we're in the kingdom of God for such a time as this. And so, Pastor, exactly. yes. Pastor Grant, won't yeah. you just go ahead and close for us in prayer? And I, I, um, David, I, I love what you spoke about when we spoke about relationship. Yes. And that the entire gospel is about relationship. When Jesus, or when Jesus came to the earth, he chose 12 disciples. And he built a relationship with them. Um, but more than that, I think when Paul writes about, he speaks about, um, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because it is salvation. And that speaks about my relationship with God, and that also determines my relationship with others. That faith works with love, by love. Yes. And uh, I'm so encouraged by that tonight. It's wonderful to see. And our, like our, you, you said <laughs> in the book of James, faith without works. works is dead. Yes. James was a Jewish person at the end of the day. All these concepts are very much a great concept. So. And I think some people forget that Mary was Jewish too. Some people think she was Catholic, but <laughs> <laughs> she, she was Jewish. <laughs> yes, she was. Yes, she was. But in that, in that as Paul writes, he, he, sp he speaks about that it's unto the Jews, but also to the Greeks. So it's all inclusive, salvation for the Jews and for the Greeks. And so it's all that gospel, that good news comes to all of us, mankind, human race, that God doesn't exclude us, but he wants to have a relationship with all of us. So encouraging. And him putting his arms around us. So I know that in this season, that's so encouraging to me that God in this season is putting his arms wow. around about around us, that you illustrated it so beautifully. So shall we stand tonight and we're going to uh, close yes. in prayer. And I'm going to ask Pastor Grant just yes. to close for us in prayer and that we sense the presence of God yes. as you were talking, David. Amen. We sense his presence that he's, he has spoken to us tonight as you've shared and that understanding and light yes. has come. The light shines in, in the dark places of our lives in this, pla in this season as we look at our lives and we say, God, what can I do for you? And shine the light in the dark places of my life where I, there might be blind spots. There are places in me that, that I don't know that are offending others, that are offending yes. you so that I can walk in peace with those that are near and those Amen. that are far. Amen. So why don't you go ahead and pray, Pastor Grant. Let's join our hearts together tonight. Father, tonight we want to allow your aura to, to light our way, Lord, to illuminate our lives, Lord, 
so that our lives becomes a clear picture of who you are Jesus father today we take account of who we are Lord and we say God all of our days Lord we lay at your feet let all of our decisions Lord be determined by the Holy Spirit Lord, let us be led by you, by the Holy Spirit, that even the divine and the secret things we will know, Father, by the Holy Spirit. And I thank you, God, for David today. I thank you for his ministry. I thank you, God, that indeed, just like Esther, you've called him for a time such as this. And this season that we are in, Lord, Father, bringing the nations together, Lord, bringing all people together from the north, the south, the east, and the west, Lord. God, I thank you, God, for this, for this divine moment that you've placed him in, for the words that would flow from his lips, Lord. I thank you that nations will be drawn to God in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you again, David. We yes. have our prayer requests that we're going to pray. God bless you. Good night. God bless you. Give our love you to your Amen. family. Thank you. And thank please you. thank them for sharing you with us during the season while they're eating and you're sharing with us. God no bless problem. you. We look forward to seeing you. Yes. Maybe in Jerusalem, maybe in Cape Town. <laughs> maybe. We'll make that happen. <laughs> yes, we'll have to make that happen. God bless. Amen. Thank you. We have these Amen. prayer requests. We want to pray over many people have sent in prayer requests. Yes. And we want to pray Thank over these. Jesus. If you'll just. Thank you, Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, Hallelujah. every prayer request, yes, Jesus. every need, you know. And in this season, we sense your presence. And as David has spoken, that in this season, it's like you putting your arms of love around about us. Thank that it, you, it's a divine hug from Thank heaven. You. That you've set this time and season apart. And we've come to pray and to seek you. Yes, and I thank you that every one of these needs you know about. And as we lay our hands upon them and we bring them to you, I thank you that you answer Jesus. and meet every need. In Jesus. And we thank you for it. Jesus, Amen. 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 The Lord Amen. bless you. Well, wasn't that amazing? I think that's the first Woo. time we've ever had an Orthodox Jew preach <laughs> to us. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> you know, Good Hope Spiritual. Christian Center, this is who we are. This is what we do. We get out on the cutting edge and ride the wave of the presence and glory of God. How many of you, the Lord really spoke to you through that? Amen. And we sense the divine hug of heaven. And uh, won't you just raise your hands and let's just worship the Lord as we close in, in a worship song right now. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all. Oh, Jesus. all about you, Jesus. From beginning to the end, divine time, it'll always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Sing it one more time. Jesus at the center of it all. Only you matter, Jesus.
your love, Lord. From my heart to the heavens, Jesus, Jesus, be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. Say that one more time. From my heart, God. center of your church. Your church. This is why you came. Jesus at the center of your church. Oh, every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess you, Jesus. That's why we hear, Lord, Jesus. Every knee will bow, and every knee will bow, and every tongue shall confess you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, say his beautiful name, yes. Jesus, at the name demons tremble. That this time in your presence is divine. You created time. You're an eternal God, but you created time. Yes. And in this time yes. and in this season, yes. we say yes to you, to your plan and yes. to your purpose. Hallelujah. That we will not say no, that we will say yes. yes and surrender to your plan. Like you did, Jesus, you said, not my will, but thine be done. So as we go tonight, Lord, I thank you for your word that has come to us, that you hold us in your arms. We're wrapped around yes. you. Your, your word says, underneath us are the everlasting arms. We're being held by you. And there is no fear in your love because perfect love casts out all fear. Thank you for it tonight, Lord. Amen. Before you go, I wanted to just thank so many of you who've been so generous in your giving to those who are in need in the church and also to the church, I mean, to the church, to our school at Bungankosi. And, you know, I wanted to say not one donation ever goes to waste that everything you give will always go to somebody who's in need nothing that you give will ever go to waste and so I want to thank you for your generosity and they sent me a list that I said I would read and we put it up on the screen white sugar well I don't know if the white sugar is so good but anyway Sam White star maize meal, plain, speckle rice, spaghetti. Thank you for those who've given the lion dried beans, lion red lentils, lion split peas. Did you know about these lion things, Pastor Grant? Peanut butter and jam, beef stock cubes, rooibos tea, black tea, rick coffee, long life milk, tin fish, and tomato sauce, tomato sauce or tomato paste in plastic, potatoes, cabbages, carrots, butternut, and onions. Um, if you're gonna bring onions, <laughs> don't leave them at the front of the church because when people come in the door, <laughs> they smell as It does smell like a bit of a soup kitchen in the front there right now. <laughs> We've got onions and carrots. But you know, <laughs> nothing, anyone ever gives goes to waste. 
So I want to thank you for your generosity in helping us in this season. The Lord bless you as you go. We love you. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow night. Throne room in the presence yes. of the Lord. Amen. We're going to have a great night worshiping God yes. and praying together. And uh, tonight, of course, is day 29 of our fasting and prayer. And our scripture for the day is just like David was sharing. Connecting my faith to others has power. And Ephesians 4.16 says, From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. So you might be supplying onions. We're being joined together by what every joint supplies. According to the effect of working, by which every part does its share and causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So thank you again. And the Lord bless you. I love you. We'll see you tomorrow night. There's nothing else.